All right, y'all. Peace and blessings. God bless you all. I'm Jarvis Kingston, and I hope that y'all doing all right, staying strong and sound in these times that we're in. I pray that you have repented and that you were baptized. I pray that you are safe, protected, and prayed up. And I just hope that whatever situation that you're going through, that the Lord is with you, that he guides you, he protects you, he looks out for you, he comforts you. I pray that your mental health gets better. And I just pray that you become more strong and wise in the Lord, that you keep him first. You're always doing his will. You stay on a narrow path. You fight the good fight of faith. And that you trust in him for, you trust him through every situation you're going through. Whether you're going through a test, a trial, tribulation, a hardship, you always trust the Lord through it all. Bless the person whose hope is in the Lord. Bless the person whose trust is in the Lord. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Let us thank the Lord for another day. Let us thank the Lord for waking us up today, giving us another chance. Let us thank the Lord for having food in our belly, clothes on our back, a roof over our head. Let us thank the Lord for protecting us coming in and coming out. All right. There's so much things to praise the Lord for, so much things to give him praise and honor because he's just so awesome. He is so amazing. His son is amazing for dying for our sins. Amen. So let us stop backsliding. Let us turn from our ways and stay on a narrow path that understand that he is the way, truth, and life. All right. So he is the path. He is the way. Okay. Let us stay strong and steadfast while we're on this journey forevermore. And let us help as much people as we can along the way as well. All right. Yes, yes, y'all. Welcome, body of Christ. Greetings, family. Shalom, everyone. Thank you all for listening, supporting. It means a lot to me. I love you all. I'm praying for you all, all right? So uh, let us always encourage one another in the Lord. Let us always uplift each other in Christ, okay? So much going on all four corners of the earth, and we are scattered all four corners of the earth, but we are still serving and praising the same creator, amen? So let us be blessed, everyone who's listening, all right? Blessings and peace to you, okay? Yes, yes, y'all. Welcome, everybody, all peoples, all nations, all tribes, all languages, all tongues, all races, all faces, all four corners of the earth. Whether you are an Israelite or a Gentile, it is all right. Whether you are chosen or adopted, it is all right. Let us be grateful, glad, and present. Let us thank the Lord. Let us come together and be united in the body of Christ. Amen. Let us be together, praising the Lord, rejoicing, and always fighting a good fight together. All right. We can't do it without Christ, and we can't do it without each other, okay? So let us be together and have good chemistry and always be on one accord for the Lord. Amen? Yes, yes, y'all. Let us uh, let us just love the Lord our God, Father, our mind, heart, soul, strength, and might. Let us love let us love our neighbors as we love ourselves, all right? Let us obey his gospel. Let us obey the word. Let us just do everything he called us to do. Let us do Father's business and Father's will for the rest of our lives until His Son comes back, okay? He is coming back like a thief in the night. He is coming back in an hour nobody knows but the Father. All right, so let's always stay ready so we don't have to get ready, amen? Let us clean it up down here with the time that we have right now and help as much people as we can to make them understand the gospel, make them get baptized, so on and so on, all right? Great commission and so forth, all right? So let us keep doing what the Lord called us to do with the time that we have, amen? Yes, yes, y'all, so... In today's message, we're going to continue our Bible reading series, okay? On the last episode, we left off at the book of Philemon, all right? So now we're in the book of Hebrews, all right? So it's a very excellent read right here. Uh, we're going to get to the book of Hebrews, and from there, we'll close out with a prayer. We'll close out with the priestly blessing, and we'll also close out with giving all the praise, honor, glory to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and praise the only begotten Son who died for our sins, Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So let us go to the book of Hebrews, okay? Now, before I get to Hebrews, I would, of course, like to read the introduction commentary prior to Hebrews chapter 1, all right? So let us go into the commentary introduction, all right? The author, some say unknown. It could be Paul. It could be one of the apostles or one of the Hebrews who wrote in this, obviously. The audience, the Jews, the Israelites, the date. Sometime before A.D. 70, when the Roman army destroys the temple in Jerusalem, the setting, the Jews grow weary of suffering persecution, probably at the hands of both Jews and Romans. The Essentials of Hebrews. People use the phrase, it doesn't get any better than this, to describe everything from products to relationships. The popularity of this line reveals a deep human longing to discover the best. Hebrews provides the ultimate embodiment of the best life has to offer. Applied to the way God reveals himself to the, wor to the world. The author of this letter lifts up Christ as a culmination of Jews' highest hopes. The original readers of Hebrews learned that Jesus stands as better than the best in every category. Further, Hebrews presents the magnificent panor pan panorama of God's all incapacitated master plan. 
Jesus wasn't an afterthought. He was the forethought. As you read Hebrews, expect to gain profound benefits as you grow in your appreciation for Jesus' excellence and surpassed worth. What to look for in Hebrews? Comparisons with Jesus led to clearer views of his greatness. Jesus holds the final word. Both baby faith and mature faith rely on Jesus. An inspiring visit to the Bible's Hall of Faithful Servants. Glimpses of the greatness of Jesus' accomplishments. What following Jesus means today. All right, so that's the introduction and the commentary for Hebrews, all right? Now let us get to Hebrews chapter 1. The Son Superior to Angels, Hebrews 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited his superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. And righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? All right. So that is the book of Hebrews chapter one reading. All right. I would love to read this in commentary scripture within Hebrews one. God made the universe. Hebrews chapter one, verse two. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. All right. So as we review the book of Hebrews chapter one. It just goes further to detail about how Jesus is superior to the angels and how the Most High designed it with the heavens and the earth and what have you and how he made Jesus the firstborn over all creation and authority and power he gave to his son and how um, the, the, the roles that he plays and the roles that angels play as well. All right. And uh, of course, Jesus, he died for our sins. You know, he came out, fulfilled the covenant. He came out, fulfilled all the prophecy. And the angels, they do their part by ministering, that they're, they're ministering spirit, ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. All right. So uh, Hebrews chapter one just goes further to detail, saying how eternal the most high is and how the world is temporary, All right, how the world will pass away. But the most high won't, neither will his word. Amen. So Hebrews one just establishes everything from the father, the son angels, the word, and creation as well. All right. Now, let us go to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. All right. Hebrews chapter 2. Here we go. Warning to pay attention. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received as just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Jesus made like his brothers. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. And putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. 
Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers, he says. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here, I, here am I and the children of and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. All right, so that is the book of Hebrews chapter 2. All right, so as we review the book of Hebrews chapter 2, the scripture just goes into detail about being more uh, careful and paying attention and to not drift away. All right, and he goes, it goes further to detail about salvation which was first announced by the Lord, all right? Also, how God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed distributed according to his will, all right? So it just goes further to detail, saying how Jesus was made like his brothers. So him coming into the flesh, helping up the descendants of Abraham to also bear their burdens, to die for our sins, to taste death, and to have that human experience to uh, bear with us and to put an end to death. All right. Also, furthermore, it also goes into detail about how everything is subject to him. All right. Everything's under his feet. All right. So God gave his son all that power, authority, sovereignty as well. Furthermore, it goes into detail saying how um, for whom and through whom everything is, this should make the author of our salvation perfect through suffering both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers, he says. All right, so furthermore, the word goes into detail about, for surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. All right, all right. So he was made like his brothers. All right, he is the tribe of Judah, an Israelite. He is Shem. All right, his race is Shem. All right, so that's the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, reading right there, okay? Now, before I go into the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, I would like to read this commentary that's within uh, the, the pages. All right, so let's go. The title of this commentary is Gospel Guardian Timothy. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and life and love and faith and in purity. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Timothy picked up the two scrolls and wandered down to the shore. One of the parchments was old and worn, the other new. Several copies had already been made of Paul's earlier letter. His most recent one had just been copied that very morning. Both were personal letters to Timothy, but he realized how valuable they would be to future generations. Paul's intimate advice here, like the content of his other letters, would touch many lives. Timothy carried the originals with him as he considered the, mouth, the months to come. He had practically memorized them already, but having the soft, pungent, smelling rolls under his arm was comforting. The words carried the unmistakable apo apostolic tone he does treat it he does treat me like a father one minute comforting me and the next asking me to lay down my life paul's closing words echoed in his younger protege's heart do your best to get here before winter timothy was ready to leave ephesians he hoped to reach rome while paul was still living and yet was this god's plan for him 
Timothy knew Paul would approve of the fact that he was asking such questions. The waters of the Aegean, Aegean were busy this day. The world was becoming a much traveled place. Timothy had lost count of the journeys he had undertaken, both alone and in the company of others. What adventures they had survived. God had certainly been their protector, but experience hasn't, hadn't, been, hadn't made lonely travel any more desirable for Timothy. He preferred the camaraderie of Paul and his other former traveling companions. The months of tension and struggle in, the, in Ephesians reminded him of Paul's first arrival in the city. Timothy, Luke, Silas, and Paul had left Corinth after a long visit and were bound for Jerusalem. Ephesians was a brief stop along the way. But as always, Paul was almost immediately plunged into daily confrontations in the local synagogue. The group had not stayed long, but Paul had encouraged Priscilla and Aquila to remain there and had promised the Ephesians that he himself would return if it is God's will. Within a year, Paul and his team were indeed back in Ephesians, where Apollos, Priscilla and Aquila had experienced some success. Ephesians was set to become was was to become Paul's home base for almost three years. The church there flourished, but Paul was always restless, always looking beyond the horizon, where he knew there were those who had not yet heard the gospel. A squabble among seagulls drew Timothy's attention back to the present. Soon, the winter chill would slow the traffic on the sea. He couldn't wait too long to decide. He would have to leave the scrolls with the Ephesians. They would need them more than he did. Back to the future. How does God fit into your typical decision-making process? Timothy saw Paul as a spiritual father. What mentoring relationships have you been involved with? How have they equipped you for ministry? In what ways do you sense God's rap, God's grand purposes for your life? The story continues to learn about Timothy's background to see how God continued to work through him. Read Acts chapter 16 through 18 and also as well. As one, First Timothy and Second Timothy. All right, all right. So that's the end of the commentary regarding Timothy. All right. So uh, the books of First and Second Timothy are very great readings as well. All right. So now let us continue in the book of Hebrews, chapter three. All right, Hebrews chapter three. Here we go. Jesus greater than Moses. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confessed. He was faithful to the one who appointed him just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus had has Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For everyone for every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house, if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. Warning against unbelief. So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me. And for 40 years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence we had at first, as has just been said. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt, and with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert, and to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? To, to those who disobeyed. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Mm. So that's the book of Hebrews chapter 3 reading, all right? All right, all right. I would love to read this in commentary scripture within Hebrews chapter 3 that's based on four of them called God invites us to approach him. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. 
Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. All right. All right. Amen. So as we review the book of Hebrews chapter three, it just goes further to detail about how Jesus held in higher honor than Moses. Um, but it's not an elitist uh, type of thing or compare, contra compare, compare, contrast the type of thing. It's just about what Moses established from the beginning and how he went about everything towards to how what Jesus did and what Jesus did for us. OK, and uh, it goes further to detail about how Moses was the builder of the house, um, not how he was faithful in all God's house and what have you. It describes how Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. And it goes further to say how Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as son over God's house, and we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. Furthermore, it goes into detail about warning against unbelief. All right, people who have unbelief and are rebellious or have a hardened heart, um, to be careful of that. Because it goes into detail about how it was with Moses, how they were in a desert for 40 years and how they were how they had a hardened heart and they were very sinful and deceitful. And uh, they didn't believe and they died in the desert and they went through those things in the wilderness. You know, so it was just comparing and contrasting how Moses went about, about it with his people, how Jesus went about with his people. All right. And that. Uh, Furthermore, um, the Israelites, they really tested and tried God and made God angry through disobedience and what have you. But furthermore, uh, Jesus' whole thing was always about bringing it back together, restoring it, and following him as the way, truth, and life. All right. So it just gives us a warning about, uh, about I guess, unbelief, man. You can't walk around with doubt, unbelief, and uh, disobedience. You can't walk in that, all right? Furthermore, it goes into detail just saying how, you know, that you should, you have to turn your sinful, unbeliever hearts, um, you, you have to turn from that and turn to God, all right? You have to encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ we, if we hold firmly to the end, the confidence was he, what we had at first, as just has it been said. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. So it's reminding us to not do what they did in the former time with their disobedience. We are called to be obedient, faithful, loyal, good listeners and doers. OK, so that sums up the book of Hebrews chapter three reading. All right. Now, let us go to the book of Hebrews chapter four. All right. Hebrews chapter four. Let's go. A Sabbath rest for the people of God. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed entered that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. It, shall, it still remains that some will enter that rest. And those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from, this, from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Mm. 
Jesus is the great high priest. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we were, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. All right, all right. So that is the book of Hebrews chapter 4 reading. Very excellent read. Furthermore, as we review Hebrews chapter 4, it goes more detail about the Sabbath rest for the people of God and how God always wanted us to rest on the seventh day and how amazing it is that he created everything in six days and rest on the seventh day. He passed that on towards us and how we should rest on the seventh day and not work, you know. And he goes further to detail about how when he was angry with Israel at one point, he told them that they shall never enter my rest because he was so angry with their disobedience and everything that, um, you know, he was really just, you know, fed up overall with the way they were living. But furthermore, uh, the Lord spoke to David and it said that today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. It also goes further to detail about for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. So let, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. All right, so the Sabbath is still something that we should live by. All right, um, even Jesus practiced the Sabbath as well. He healed on the Sabbath. He did, uh, he did miracles on the Sabbath and kept it holy. And he even declared that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. All right, furthermore, Hebrews chapter 4 goes into detail about how the word is a double-edged sword, how powerful it is, how it cuts through the soul, the spirit, the joints, the marrow, and it judges, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Mm. Everything is uncovered and laid before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The word is powerful. It cuts deep, people. The word is a double-edged sword, not a butter knife. All right. It's it's a double-edged sword, okay? That's why it triggers a lot of people. It gets people uptight. It makes people argumentative. It gets people angry, and people get offended by the word. <laughs> you quote a scripture nowadays, and somebody about to chop your head off over it. <laughs> that's, that's how much the word, how powerful it is. Um, knowing that the word is a double-edged sword, we have to be very responsible with how we use it, all right? There's many people who misuse the word, um, who misinterpret it. There's people who use it for personal gain, financial gain. People twist it. Um, they're going to get judged for that because you don't play with the most highest word. You don't play with uh, serious things, uh, spiritual matters, okay? And when people distort the word, they try to water it down. Um, they're lukewarm about it. You get what I'm saying? Like, God, we're gonna, people are going to be held account to that, man. That's why when I do these Bible readings, man, I, I like to read the word thoroughly. I don't like to make up my own stuff or even want to add to it or take from it. Amen. Because um, the word is very powerful. You got to respect it. All right. You got to accept it. Um, people who always argue about the Bible, argue about scriptures, they don't respect the most high's word. Uh, people like to throw their opinions and emotions on top of something that God already established. All right. So um, the word is a double edged sword, man. And you walk around with that sword, man. I'm telling you, you're going to be slain, all right? That is our weapon of spiritual warfare, all right? But the armor of God, the word is our sword, okay? So you got to remember, as we're walking around with this double-edged sword in these last days, uh, <laughs> trust me, man, people going to pull up, you know what I mean? That spiritual warfare, they're going to pull up on you with that, about that, okay? So that's why you have to always be alert, be firm, always stay in that word, okay? That's the... That's how you defeat everything and everybody, the word. Remember when Jesus went fasting and praying and the devil went and tempted him and all that, how did Jesus defeat him? Through the word. He stood firm in the word because the devil, the devil attacked him while he was fasting and praying, trying to like manipulate him, trying to misinterpret scripture, trying to like, you know, uh, trick him and come with those schemes or whatever. And, and Jesus wasn't having it. Amen. So. That's the importance of being in that word, being firm in it, people. Got to be firm in that word, y'all. Have to, all right? 
it's double edged sword for real, man. All right, let's help people. Um, let's help people understand the word, man. Give out the word. All right, now, even in Psalms, David said how the word is like pure silver, how fine it is. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, the word can be very excellent, beautiful, but it is a double edged sword nonetheless. All right, and whoever loves correction and knowledge, wisdom, understanding loves the word. When you read the book of Proverbs, Solomon goes on and on about the importance of giving a good word and how a good a good word makes the heart glad. And a person who hates correction is stupid. You know, like it says those things. And those who reject uh, wisdom, understanding are foolish. So uh, David, Solomon, they really was well with the word because remember, Solomon prayed to God for wisdom and knowledge, understand how to deal with his people and what have you, how to judge things. So when you really, when you read in the whole entire Bible, obviously it's God's word, but when you read in Proverbs, that's, God directly telling Solomon all these things. So that's how powerful uh, Proverbs is. And it's also David talking to uh, Solomon as well, so Psalms too. But the word is powerful, people, okay? Do not compromise the word. Do not water it down for nobody, all right? Because whether you're social media on the internet or whether in real life in the environment that you're in, uh, the word naturally offends people. So that's why we are set apart people a lot of times when we're about truth and the word, it will, we will be alienated and isolated. That kind of comes along with it. You have to remember prophets were loners. They were by themselves because um, ain't nobody wanted to be around that. You remember, like, it's, you're not always going around spreading a, a feel-good message and tickling somebody's itching ears. The word of the Lord, you have to tell it like it is. And it's, you know what I mean, as it is. So the word is very powerful, okay? Furthermore, Hebrews chapter 4 goes into detail about Jesus being the great high priest and how amazing it is that he died for our sins and he was able to sympathize with our weaknesses because it wasn't for a high priest to really uh, sympathize with people. High priests were very disciplined, firm, very strong men, very firm and what have you. Um, you got to remember, like most prophets, priests didn't really have mercy. The way they was, the things they were dealing with, their person, their, their, their calling, the way they lived their lives, they were like strong, firm, and what have you. Jesus had the strength firm, and he had the mercy and grace on top of that. That's what makes him so excellent, so amazing. Um, because most people of the most high, um, like the real high priests, like the real super prophets, like they didn't really have that grace and mercy. They were very like strong, rough, and what have you. But they, of course, they had the love of God in them, of course. But um, Christ had the love of God and the love of people as well. All right. But then again, it's understandable why um, some of the prophets didn't really have that grace and mercy because they got treated so like harshly. They got treated so bad that um, <laughs> it, it kept isolating them. It kept being by themselves or what have you. So they were able to just carry out God's word to keep it moving, not really sympathize with people and all that, because um, <laughs> they, they weren't wired that way. You know, like you talking about ancient times and how men were back then. They weren't really wired that way. OK. And Jesus always presses us to have that grace and mercy towards others as well, being loving and forgiving as well. Amen. So always got to keep that in mind. All right. So uh, what I love about Hebrews 4 at the end, it says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. Very powerful. Okay. Time of need. Amen. So that's Hebrews chapter four. Now. Let us go to Hebrews chapter 5. All right, Hebrews chapter 5, here we go. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a high, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Hmm. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. 
and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Warning against falling away. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Hmm. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Hmm. All righty. So that is the book of Hebrews chapter 5. Very excellent read right there. As we review the book of Hebrews chapter 5, it just goes further to detail explaining how every high priest selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in the matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifice for sins. Okay, so you think about the order of Melchizedek, it goes there, and Samuel, um, and further on, and Jesus was a high priest as well. You know, Moses, Aaron, they were priests too, the priesthood. So, um, yeah. Furthermore, it goes to the saying how he was able to deal gently with those who were ignorant going astray. He says he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifice for his own sins as well for the sins of the people. All right. So as we review that, um, remember in ancient times, whenever they did like sin offerings, burnt offerings or what have you, they always had to kill an animal and put it at the altar or the sanctuary and do their customs or what have you. We don't have to do that because um, Jesus was the lamb without blemish. He was the ultimate sacrifice for us. All right. And being under that grace and mercy, we don't have to um, be under Christ's blood. We don't have to, like, go find a random animal and kill it. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, but oh no, we should be very appreciative and grateful for Christ's blood being shed for us. All right. That's why we should live better and do and be on point, because um, we serve an awesome father and son. Amen. So let us be more self-controlled. Let us be more disciplined about how we go about our lives, okay? All right, all right. Furthermore, Hebrews chapter 5 goes more to detail saying how no one takes his honor upon him, takes his honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son today. I have become your father. Hmm. So this shows that God has to appoint you, okay, not yourself. When we look today across all over the world when it comes to churches and ministries, there's probably a few hand-select, like, chosen, appointed people really from God. But most people appoint themselves um, to walk around these different titles or so-called positions, and God didn't even appoint them. Um, this is why certain churches and ministries or things across the world are not that effective, because you have people who are not chosen, appointed, or equipped trying to do this stuff. And then remember, Jesus said, those who say, Lord, Lord, are not getting in. He says, depart from me, I never knew you. Because they're going to say what? Oh, well, we did miracles in your name. Oh, we did this in your name. But I don't know you. <laughs> you see, like you have people who don't know the Lord personally, who don't know the Most High, never had an encounter. And who is not equipped or appointed or anointed or chosen by him at all, doing all the stuff. You got to remember, there's false apostles, false pastors, false preachers, false miracles, false signs. Well, there's all types of false prophesies that you got to understand that. So that discernment, you got to have discernment, people. Do not lean on your own understanding. Do not be like, oh, well, this person's nice. This person's charismatic. I like the way they preach and this, this, and that. Don't get, don't man, hey, man, do not get caught up in that, man. You better have discernment and see through a person's fruits, man. You better have discernment and let the Lord guide you about how you listen to certain people or be careful about who put hands on you. You got to be discerning. You got to have discernment, all right? Because remember, there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. When you read Hebrews 5, man, it talks about how like people have to be appointed by God. They got to be called by God to do this stuff. Everybody ain't called by the Most High. People calling up themselves, exalting themselves and doing this stuff. That's the problem. You know what I mean? You got to be called, anointed, preordained, predestined, chosen, equipped to do the things of God, whether it's priesthood, prop, being a prophet, um, anything of the most high. You, you got to be called to do that stuff. You, can't, you don't just wake up and get influenced and do it. You got to be called to do it. All right. Furthermore, it goes into saying that 
And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So remember, David wrote Psalms about Melchizedek as well. David wrote Psalms about everything, about giving glory, praise, and exalting his name, everything. He wrote Psalms about animals, everything. Um, David wrote plenty of Psalms about Christ as well. And then he also referenced Melchizedek. All right. So the thing about the order of Melchizedek, the reason why Christ is under that order is because Christ is not under the, he's not under the priesthood, the order of um, Aaron and Moses, because Aaron and Moses is Levi. Christ is Judah. All right. Remember, Levi was the like priesthood tribe or what have you. Judah's the kingship tribe. So Ju Christ is from Judah and he's from David. All right. Melchizedek, it was a high priest and a king. Jesus is a high priest and a king. That's why he's under that order. Whenever there's an establishment of a promise, a blessing, a covenant, or an order or a foundation of God, there's two types of people you always need. You always need a high priest and you always need a king. You always need the two. You need a priest, you need a king to establish things um, in a powerful manner. Uh, Melchizedek and Jesus are the only two people within the scriptures that are both a high priest and a king. So it's not it's not common to for people to be both in one. You got to have a super powerful calling, prophetic uh, uh, purpose on your life to be two in one. You know, uh, some people could just be one or the other, but not uh, only Mel Melchizedek and Christ were two in one. Um, so remember. When Abraham was on his way, to, when Abraham was getting blessed, who who he met along the way? Melchizedek. And he was the king of Solomon, the prince, high priest of King Solomon. So Melchizedek met Abraham, okay, along the way of the along the way. Samuel anointed David. Samuel was a priest, David was the king. Okay? Jesus the high priest and the king. To restore the second, with the second temple, Zerubbabel, he was the high, he was the king, the co the governor of Judah, the prince of Judah, royalty. Joshua, the high priest, he was a high priest, you see, and they're the two witnesses as well. Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, they're both the two witnesses within Haggai, Revelations, and Zechariah. So you always need a high priest. You always need a king. When it comes to establishing a people, a kingdom, a promise, a blessing, a covenant, a temple, what have you. So that's how God always did those types of things regarding that, okay? So Jesus is from the order of Melchizedek. You got to remember, that's why, like, the, the Pharisees and all these people, they press Jesus so hard. Because remember, every time the Pharisees and people argue with Jesus about the law or about Moses, remember, Jesus respected the law of Moses. He fulfilled it. Like he did every commandment. He didn't break not one. He followed every commandment. He said not one jot, not one tittle will uh, depart from the law. So basically he did every law and statute commandment that there was. All 613, he did all of that. Okay. And we got to remember that. But he still, even though he wasn't under the order of Aaron and Moses, he still respected it and followed through with it because he understood how God gave Israel that in the first place. You get what I'm saying? Jesus was under Melchizedek. So you got to remember, Melchizedek is very mysterious, and so is Jesus. Remember, Melchizedek, he popped out of nowhere on Abraham. He popped out of nowhere. You know, I'm pretty sure there's a whole bunch of, like, books on Melchizedek, like lost books, if y'all could, like, find them and buy them or search them, read them, because I'm really interested in Melchizedek. I want to learn more about him as well and what have you. But um, all in all, remember, Melchizedek was mysterious. He popped on Abraham. He popped on him out of nowhere. And Jesus obviously serves a God who works in mysterious ways. So Jesus had a mysterious ways about how he did things too. That's why people could never understand his parables and never understand um, why he did things the way he did. Like, why is he doing a, a Sabbath? Uh, why is he doing a miracle on a Sabbath? Or why he's saying he did this, this, and that. See, so he's from the order of Melchizedek. So they, that's a whole different <clears throat> like order. That's a whole different like priesthood. That's a whole different range, okay? So there's there's levels to this stuff, okay? There's levels to this, you know, some are prophets, some are priests, but, you know, like Christ is all the way, all the way up. He's all that at once. So that's what makes Christ so amazing and special, amen? Yes, yes, y'all. And uh, furthermore, when you read Hebrews chapter 5, it goes more into detail about how uh, Christ offered prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears uh, to save those from death. 
and with submission and what have you. And it also goes to saying that he is a source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. I love saying that like at the end of my videos and everything, because he is the source of eternal salvation. He truly is. And he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So God is the one who does all the designation, the picking, the choosing, the creating, the organizing. God is in control, y'all. God chooses his people. He anoints them. He equips them. He pure days it. He sets it up from the get-go. Man cannot take away from it. Man cannot add to it. Them Pharisees was trying to take away who Christ was all the time, and they couldn't do nothing about it. There's no wisdom or counsel against the Lord. Amen. Who God chooses, that's who he chooses. Who God anoints, that's who he anoints. Who God equips, that's who he equips. Amen. So let us always all be in our purpose and get Father's business done. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Furthermore, when you read Hebrews chapter 5, it goes more into detail about warnings against falling away. And that um, he goes further to say how we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who, by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish food, to who distinguish them, distinguish good from evil. It just goes to comparison and contrasting about food and milk and digesting things with the word of God. Remember, because the word is like the bread of life, the bread. So how you digest it, how you use it, how you practice it according to righteousness, it could determine if you're spiritually young or spiritually mature, you know, stuff like that. So there's some people who are uh, spiritually mature and don't need to be spoon fed. And then there's some who are like new to the walk with God, new to the Bible, new to all these things. So they have to like kind of, you got to show them the ropes. You get what I'm saying? But all in all, uh, let us not have no elitism about it. Let us be patient with everybody. Um, if somebody's more spiritually mature than you and experience or in the word or what have you, learn from them, take in that wisdom, not to understand it. If um, you see someone who's a bit spiritually immature or what have you, be patient with that person, be kind and compassionate, understand where they're coming from and them entering the walk with God, the Bible, stuff like that. Um, this is why when I do my Bible readings, I always just try my best to... Uh, to interpret like every scripture I can by the grace of God, by his spirit, uh, by, by, because I never know who's listening. I never know what walks of life y'all coming from. I don't know if all y'all spiritually mature or if all y'all just coming into this. So that's why I always have to break it down. I don't know if it's a young child watching it. I don't know if it's a five-year-old or a 10-year-old watching my stuff, hearing it. So uh, that's why with every scripture I like to always break it down um, the, as best as I can, because I never know who's listening. But all in all... Um, yeah, that, that wraps up uh, Hebrews chapter 5. All right, excellent read. Now, let us go to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. All right, Hebrews chapter 6, here we go. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that led to death and of faith in God. Instruction about baptisms, the laying, of hand, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment and God permitting we will do so. Excuse me. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit. Hold on, let me repeat that, my bad. Who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. If they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Hmm. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and produce the crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Mm. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. The certainty of God's promise. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what, has, what, what, what was promised. 
Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope, take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, where Jesus who went before us had has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Yes, yes, y'all. So that's the book of Hebrews chapter six reading. Very great read. All right. So as we review Hebrews chapter six reading, it goes into detail saying about to leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. All right. Let us not have arrested development. Let us keep going upward and growth and maturity spiritually in Christ and to not be at level one. Okay, let us go higher and higher. God wants to take us higher, higher levels with him personally, with our relationship, but also with the things he wants to do in our lives and use us and get out of our stagnation and routine and over and over. God wants to keep taking us higher places. All right, it's no more just sitting at level one. God wants to bring you higher places, okay? Higher, higher um, ground, okay? So goes further about elementary uh, teachings of Christ and uh, to go on maturity, not laying, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that led to death and the faith in God. Instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of death and eternal judgment and God permitting we will do so. And it says it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, that they fall away to be brought back to repentance because of their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again. Wow. And subjected him to public disgrace. Wow, that's powerful. That's, wow. So it says here, like, basically, when you backslide, when you go back on the wayside, and you come back to repentance, it's like you crucify him all over again. That's public disgrace. So we have to stay on this narrow path. You got to be strong, firm. Stay on this narrow path. All right. You got to stay on it, people. Okay. Stay on it. Furthermore, it goes into detail discussing about a similar parable, a parable Jesus talked about where it says land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and it is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it'll be burned. All right. So Jesus made many parables within the Gospels about that, how like a seed is planted in good soil, it produces crops and bear fruit. A 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. But uh, Jesus also talked about um, certain farms and stuff that uh, it got thorns and thistles. It'll be burnt up and thrown into the fire. So basically, saying someone who bears good fruit, um, there'll be a blessing on top, a blessing on top of them, a heavenly, eternal life. But a person who doesn't bear fruit, or a person who does not uh, do the things of God, is a wicked, lazy servant. It'll be thrown into the fire, thrown into hell, thrown into eternal. Uh, um, Ever, uh, eternal fire, the lake of fire, okay? Furthermore, um, Hebrews chapter 6 goes into detail about more of salvation and how God will not forget our work and the love we have shown him and help his people continue to help them. All right, God doesn't uh, forget anything, people, okay? Furthermore, let us not be lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. All righty, all righty. Furthermore, it goes into detail about God's promise, the certainty, how certain it is. And it goes back to the, the promise that God gave to Abraham, all right, and how um, it came to pass, all right? God's, vo God's word does not come back void. When God says something, it's going to come to pass, okay? Believe that, all right? And it goes to the, the promise he gave to Abraham about, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And after so waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. So the key word there is patiently. All right, we have to be patient in this walk with God. A lot of times I speak for myself, of course, and probably anybody who's listening, we, we can be very impatient about many things. Um, in a physical, worldly, carnal sense, we've been impatient about <laughs> certain people with certain energies and we carry them so a certain way. <laughs> We're impatient when it comes to tolerating certain things with someone or we could be impatient waiting on food <laughs> or what have you. 
or waiting for a service or customer service, what have you, or having patience with your coworkers, having patience with your uh, family or friends or whatever. But um, spiritual patience, patience is actually one of the fruits of the spirit as well. Patience, temperance, self-control, like patience, um, it's very important. All right, when God tells you something or show you something. It doesn't always mean it's going to be right on the spot. Like some cases may be instant, a twinkle of an eye, instantly split second. And then other things take time to build up and process. All right. Because if there is no need for patience, whatever, there would be no need for faith. You get what I'm saying? Like faith, patience, all that goes hand in hand. So um, when you have faith in what God promised you or told you, showed you, you have to have the patience to go along with it. Being patient don't mean you just sit like a duck and just sit there. Patience means that while you're still living and working towards what God has for you, um, you don't know exactly what day, time it's going to come, but you know it's going to come to pass. That's that true patience that Abraham had and displayed. And we must have that same type of patience as well. All right, Remember, Job had patience. Abraham had patience. All the, all the men of the Most High had patience. They all had patience. That's one thing they all had in common. They knew how to wait on God. They knew how to obey him. They knew how to um, work towards what he said he was going to do. Certain promises or certain blessings, certain things might take a few months. Some might take a year. Some might take more years. All right. So that patience, building up our character, bettering ourselves, growing better to receive that uh, promise or what have you, that blessing is very important. All right, because we, we live in this fast-paced world, this fast-moving world, this entitled generation. We are an entitled people. We always think we need, need things now and need it right away. And, oh, if I don't get it now, then you see, and that, that impatience is it, it, a bad thing because once you, get, once you get it, once you get spoiled, it ruins you because your character didn't build up enough for it. You didn't go through enough for it. When you go through a lot, you get that testimony, your character's built up, then that blessing comes through. That way you're able to, um, handle it better. You get what I'm saying? So Abraham had patience, y'all, and he had faith too. He was a friend of God. You know, that's very powerful. You know, that's very powerful, you know, and um, and how God made that oath to Abraham and how God is not a man that should lie, all right? And he goes about saying two unchangeable things that God, it's impossible for God to lie. And also we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us many great may to to us may be greatly encouraged we have this hope this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure it enters the inner sanctuary but behind the curtain where Jesus who went before us had has entered on our behalf he has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek remember that so Christ fulfilled all of that in one he is Abraham's promise amen so Patience, people, patience, all right? So that's Hebrews chapter 6 reading. Now, let us go to the book of Hebrews chapter 7. All right, the book of Hebrews chapter 7, here we go. Melchizedek the priest. This Melchizedek was king of Salem, Salem and priest of, of the God Most High. He met Abraham, returning from the defeat of the kings, and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Solomon means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the son of God, he remains a priest forever. Hmm. Just think of just think how great he was. Even a patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Hmm. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people. That is their brothers, even though their brothers are Descended from Abraham, this man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. Hmm. In the one case, the tenth is collected by men who die, but in the other case, by him who was declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects a tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Very powerful, interesting. Jesus like Melchizedek. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical, the Levi, Le, the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the law was given to the people. Why was there still need for another priest to come? 
one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. Hmm. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at that altar at the altar. For it is, it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priest. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, to his ancestry but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life, for it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Hmm. Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak. But the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has, made, who has been made perfect forever. Yes, yes, y'all. That's the book of Hebrews chapter 7 right there. Very excellent, powerful read right there. It's a lot to digest, okay? So furthermore, as we review Hebrews chapter 7, it goes detail about Melchizedek the priest. And it said how he met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. All right. And also, it goes further to saying how his name means king of righteousness. And that also is king of Salem means king of peace. Without a father or a mother, without genealogy, genealogy. Without beginning of days or end of life, like the son of God, he remains a priest forever. So when Melchizedek, he just pulled up on Abraham. <laughs> he just popped up on him because it doesn't go further to detail about his bloodline, his lineage or anything. Now, remember, this was even before the tribes or anything were settled. Remember that. Um, so if there's any like other books of Melchizedek or like, missing books of Melchizedek, we should really like try to read up on that because I think that's a very interesting read. Um that's just very powerful how he met Abraham. I think that's very powerful. And furthermore, it goes into detail about about Levi, how Levi um, used to collect the, the do the 10% as well, giving the tenth of things as well. It goes further to saying how, just think of how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now, the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect the tenth from the people. That is their brothers, even though their brothers are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by men who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham. Because when Melchizedek, yes, yes. So it's very interesting when you read more about Melchizedek and Levi, Abraham, and what have you. All right. Furthermore, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor at that time. All right. With Abraham, Melchizedek. And furthermore, uh Hebrews chapter 7 goes more to detail about how Jesus is like Melchizedek, how they're both priests, how they're both kings, all in one, and how they both represent indestructible life. Because remember, with Melchizedek, they couldn't really keep trace, trace of him. And then with Christ, of course, he represents eternal life as well. Remember, the everlasting father, so forth and so forth. That's why it's also read, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. All right, and... So the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. 
All right, so the oath, the covenants, uh, it's all powerful and amazing. And it says, but, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood, permanent priesthood, okay? So it's very amazing to read about Melchizedek, all right? It says, such a high priest meets our needs, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifice day after day, for, first for his own sins and then for the sins of other, other people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. So... It's very amazing to hear about the oath, covenants, promises, priesthood, Abraham, Melchizedek, Jesus, all in one. Very powerful reading right there, okay? So that is the book of Hebrews chapter 7, all right? What I'd love to do before I get into Hebrews chapter 8, I would love to read the commentary that is um, in, the, in the pages, all right? So here we go with the commentary. Today's Bible reading Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. Recommended reading, Psalm 130, verses 1 through 8. The book of Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 40. And also the book of Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. The title of the commentary is The Waiting Room. Waiting might well be the hardest single thing we ever have to do. We wait in traffic. We wait in a doctor's office. In the waiting room. We wait to hear news, good or bad. We're not patient people. Most of us resemble a child like Christ's mass time, eagerly anticipating the time to open presents. Christmas, I open presents. Each hour seems like an, an eternity. When the, de when the designated time arrives, we can't move fast enough to get to the Christmas tree and tear open all those tantalizing wrap gifts. But try as we might, we can't make time go any faster. Waiting is a part of our modern life. No matter how fast-paced and hectic our daily schedules may be, we still run up against times and places where we have no choice but to stop and sit or stand in line. The Bible often connects waiting with faith. Sometimes scripture even uses the two words interchangeably. While we wait, while we might not like it, waiting serves an important role in our life, in our Christian life. The work God does within us while we wait is just as important as whatever it is we're waiting for. Mm -hmm. Of course, none of us finds waiting easy. In fact, it might bring pain and will not most and will almost certainly try us and test us. Waiting, waiting demands patience and exacts a price. It's the toll on the road that each of us must pay. God promised Abraham a blessing. I will give you many descendants. Verse 14. But to receive his blessing, Abraham had to wait day after day, year after year. In time, God did fulfill his promise, and Abraham's waiting turned out to have been his greatest blessing. He was to become the father of the Jews' nation. We also hear the promises of God and long for God to fulfill them, yet we often wait. If Abraham's story teaches us anything, it's that God proves himself faithful again and again. As guys, we want, to, we want something to do, some action to take, but sometimes our part is simply to wait with a confident discipline and patient assurance that God will keep his promises, he will come through. While such times aren't easy, in the end, we can honestly reflect that it was worth the wait. Indeed, waiting can result in our greatest blessing. Amen. Things to take away from this commentary. For what are you waiting on, God, right now? Mm. Why do you think waiting is difficult? Hmm. What work do you think God does within us while we wait? Whew, that's some real commentary right there. The waiting room. Patience, patience, patience. It's very important that we have patience, people. You know how much Bible verses that says, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord. My hope is in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. There's so much scriptures throughout the Old and New Testament that constantly says that because we constantly have to do that. These men of God, when they got their blessing, when they got their rescue, when they got their healing, their deliverance, or what have you, their victory, Hey, we're waiting on God, people. So wait on the Lord. His timing is due timing, perfect timing. Amen. I'm telling you, rushing things is not it, man. People who rush, they say, you know, there's always that quote, fools rush in. <laughs> okay. So the time management of things is always important. It's what we do while we're waiting. You know, God is working on our attitudes. He's working on our 
uh, routines, our disciplines. He's bettering our minds, hearts, and strength. He's making us mentally stronger as we're getting towards the blessing. He's making our hearts more pure as we're approaching it. He's making our soul more restored and cleansed and not tormented no more as we're approaching the blessing. God is constantly working on us, in us, purifying us, molding us. Amen. Bettering our character. Yes, yes, y'all. Stay patient, people. Stay patient. Amen. All right, y'all. So that was the book of Hebrews chapter 7 with the commentary, all right? Now, what I love to do is read Hebrews chapter 8, all right? The book of Hebrews chapter 8, here we go. The high priest of a new covenant. The point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Hmm. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest. For there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build a tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But the ministry Jesus has received is a superior is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. And it is founded on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, the time has come, declares the Lord. When I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers. When I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they all they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. All right. So that's the book of Hebrews chapter 8 reading right there. All right. Very excellent, lovely reading. As we read that part, Paul, uh, the, the scripture goes into detail about the high priest of a new covenant and how it all goes back to the book of Jeremiah with the, the new covenant that was declared for Israel, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, declaring the law and and what have you, okay? And how we would be his we would be his people, he would be our God, okay? But um I want to read this in commentary scripture within Hebrews eight, where it says God saves completely, the book of Hebrews chapter seven, verse twenty five. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Mm, very powerful too. Um you know, digest, very powerful to know that he always intercedes for us. It's very powerful and amazing. He intercedes for us. It's very beautiful. So let's not take that for granted, all right? Let's not take the most high and the sun for granted. Let's not take his promises, his word for granted. Let us really be a point excellent for the Lord, all right, y'all? I just love that covenant that the Lord gave us, all right? Just love it because he said that um, my laws will be in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. So when people say that the law is done away with and oh, people don't follow the law no more, that's a very a foolish thing to say because the law and the new covenant and all those things go hand in hand. So always got to keep that in mind. All right. Now, that's the book of Hebrews chapter 8 reading. Now what I would love to do is read the book of Hebrews chapter 9. All right. The book of Hebrews chapter 9, here we go. Worship in the earthly tabernacle. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up in its first room where the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing 
the atonement cover, but we cannot discuss these things in detail now. Hmm. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry, but only the high priest entered the inner room. And that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. The blood of Christ. When Christ came as a high priest, came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean how much more then will the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to god cleanse our consciences from acts that led to death so that we may serve the living god hmm. for this reason christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it, it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, I stopped and sprinkled the scroll and on all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant, which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood, 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 both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with the blood, with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. That Christ would have no, that Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Hmm. Powerful. All right. So that's the book of Hebrews chapter nine right there. All right. So as we review Hebrews chapter nine, this just goes more further to detail of explaining with Moses and how he dealt with the tabernacle and the offerings and the killing animal sacrifices, what have you, and sprinkling the blood. But this one goes into further depth about how Jesus was a sacrifice for us. Okay, so it shows how he gave his life up for our sins. Okay, but in Moses' time, they had to kill bulls, uh, goats, certain animals, and sprinkle the blood and what have you, wash with blood, what have you. But Christ, um, him dying for our sins, his blood. You know, it really, you know, cleaned us. It, it, his blood did it for us, okay? It was by him dying for us that we're able to have eternal life and all those beautiful things, all right? So it was just showing the difference between the old covenant with Moses and the new covenant with Christ, all right? And remember, Christ is the lamb without blemish, so only he was worthy to do that. Since he is the true son of God, he sits at the right hand. He's the firstborn of creation, Um Yes, yes, man. We should, we should really be thankful for the Lord, man, sending his son, man. Because you got to remember, Israel was really wilding out. They was really going the wrong way, man, with the Baal worship, the Tammuz worship, um, the Queen of Heaven worship. They, they they really went doing what the other nations was doing. So God sent his only begotten son to steer us back to restore Israel to 
you know, fulfill the covenant promises to bring us back to him. Um, it's a very amazing, powerful, beautiful thing. You know, Jesus come back, he's coming back for his, for his people, man. So it's a very amazing thing, all right? So always keep that in, in mind, all right? Now, that was the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Now let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 10, all right? Hebrews chapter 10, here we go. Christ sacrificed once for all. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifice repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. For he says, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the blood of, of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away the sins. But when, the, but when this priest had offered for, the, for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I'll make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds their sins and lawless acts. I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. A call to persevere. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most high, the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through this curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hmm. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering? Contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in the prison and joyfully accepted the, confis the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Yes, yes, y'all. So that is the book of Hebrews chapter 10 reading. All right. Very excellent reading, just putting a stamp on Christ's blood for us and how amazing it is and how we are to live accordingly to the knowledge of truth and the 
acknowledgement of the Father, Son, and the covenant and how to go about things from here on, understanding that people will be judged and also that, um, you know, we have to be more mindful of how we live our lives now, knowing that we're now that we're into the truth and how we have to persevere through all these things, okay? Understand the promises and understand to always remain faithful. All right, yes, yes. So I want to read this in commentary scripture that was within Hebrews chapter 10, okay? It's God is faithful, the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Yes, yes, y'all. God is faithful, okay? So I just see a deal about Christ's sacrifice once for all and also about a call to persevere, man, okay? I understand his grace, his mercy, his love. It's powerful, man. You understand how powerful his love, grace, and mercy is? You go about things in life better. All right, so let's appreciate Christ and and just, just thank the Lord for everything, man. Always thank him, okay? Now, what I'd love to do before I get into Hebrews chapter 11, I would love to read a commentary within Hebrews chapter 10, all right? So here we go. All right, with the commentary of today's Bible reading, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 39. Recommended reading, the book of Leviticus chapter 16, the book of Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, the book of Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39, and also the book of 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The title of this commentary is Blood on His Hands. Now, the sacrifice of atonement involved lots of blood. That should be a clue for us as to its importance to God. Once a year, the high priest entered the most sacred place on earth to offer up to God the blood of an animal. As a result, according to the law, the people of Israel temporarily stood in right relationship before the Creator Father. Those, those of us who grew up attending Sunday school sometimes have a misperception that the temple was a place like the church in which we grew up, typically clean, orderly, and with a planned program for worship. Most people dressed in their Sunday best, sat quietly during the service, and then enjoyed refreshments afterward. But that's not what the Israelites experienced. The temple was for them a place of slaughter, bloodletting, and sacrifice. To be sure, the sacrifice was a messy business. Hearing the cries of the resistant animal, watching the priest execute the slaughter, and spread the sacrificed animal's blood on the altar, and then watching the carcasses being sliced, cut, and burned in a sacrifice to God, yes, this was a visceral experience quite opposite of what we experience in worship today. Yet this was brutal, yet this brutal, this brutal, Ritual represented God's provision for Israel to become once again right with him. We shouldn't be surprised that God's new permanent arrangement for people to come to him also required blood on someone's hands. Jesus' blood stained many hands, those of Judas, the Jewish Pharisees, the Roman government, even Pilate, who tried in advance to wash the symbolic stains from his hands, but Jesus' blood fell mostly on the hands of his own father, the God who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, for us all. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Our sin separates us from God, makes us wrong before him. In turn, God's sacrifice of his own son cancels our separation from God. The blood of his son sets us right before the Father. That's the far-reaching extent of our Father's love for us. He reaches out to us today with those same blood-stained hands, the permanent atonement sacrifice of the unblemished lamb. Jesus permits us to draw near to God. Verse 22. To hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, verse 23. To spur one another on, verse 24. To not give up and to encourage one another, verse 25. Amen. Things to take away from the commentary. Take a few minutes to read Leviticus chapter 16. Why do you think God required such elaborate ritual and detail for the sacrifice of atonement? According to Old Testament law, Israel needs to offer a sacrifice to become right before God. In the New Testament, Jesus becomes the final sacrifice for all. Why did God require a sacrifice at all? How does the thought that the Father gave Jesus up for us all make you feel about God? Why? What effect does this have on your life? All right, very powerful and reflective commentary, right? The Lord gave up his only begotten son for our sins, man. All right, so... Always think about that, amen. Now, let us go into the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. All right. 
the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Here we go. By faith. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man. When God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith he still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Mm. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he commended, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. Mm. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who made the promise, who had made the promise. And so from this one man... And he, as good as deed, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity had have had opportunity to return instead they were longing for a better country a heavenly one therefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he has prepared a city for them by faith abraham when god tested him offered isaac as a sacrifice he who had received the promises was about to sacrifice as a one and only son even though god had said to him it is through isaac that your offspring will be reckoned abraham reasoned that god could raise the dead And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to, rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a short time. Hmm. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of great value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. Invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. Yeah, yeah. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who, through faith, conquered kingdoms and ministered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. 
Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and the caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So that's the book of Hebrews chapter 11. It's actually one of my favorite uh, chapters, my favorite reads in the scriptures as well, just by faith. Amen. We review Hebrews 11 just by faith. All these things were accomplished and done by faith. Amen. That faith is powerful, people. It's impossible to please God without faith because you have to know who he is. You got to know. You got to come to exist. You got to know who he is. All right. He even says that. It says that, you know, yes, yes, y'all. It says that, yes, yeah, it says that without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We have to earnestly seek him, y'all. Our faith, people, trust in the Lord. Our faith, all these amazing things happen throughout Israelite history because of faith. Faith, 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 faith. People today are so discouraged and straight away and so down and out and all that. But that faith, man, faith, people, faith. You know the Lord going to do it. You trust in the Lord. You know the Lord got you. That faith, people. Got to keep that faith, y'all. So much great things could be accomplished through faith, people. Amen. So keep that faith, y'all. All right. So that is Hebrews chapter 11 reading. Now, before I get into Hebrews chapter 12, I would love to read the commentary within Hebrews 11, all right? So here we go. Today's Bible reading, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 40. Recommended reading, the book of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 31. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. The title of this commentary is The Hall of Faithful Servants. It seems almost cheap for us to compare this hall of faithful service to some sporting hall of fame. Sacrilegious to compare saints to sports stars. Profane to draw comparisons between the life of faith and athletic achievement. Borderline blasphemy to liken trophies, plaques, and and human praise to the words of the almighty God. Well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. Think of the completely inequitable, inequitable, Comparisons, the applause of men compared to the pleasure of God, verse 5. A museum visited by gawking tourists and sports enthusiasts versus the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God, verse 10. A stadium or arena in contrast to the better heavenly country, verse 16. Being named MVP compared to the reward God gives to those who earnestly seek him, verse 6. In fact, there's no comparison. The fading glory of a sports record glows like a dimly light candle next to the enduring blaze of sun of God's commendation. Mm -hmm. Yet we can't see the full glory of these faithful men and women who chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a short time. Verse 25. Perhaps we need analogies, however flawed, to give us some idea of this unseen glory. Still, we must recognize the utter limitation of comparisons that use mere earthly reality to illuminate heavenly reality. Remember that the eternal hall of faith servants is far, far more glorious, weighty and real than anything this life has to offer. Mm -hmm. Let this inspire you to run the race of faith with intensity. The sports world has never known. Has never known. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Things to take away from this commentary. In what ways does your life demonstrate that your hope is not in this world, but in the world to come? What causes you to take your eyes off the prize of the city with fountains whose architect and builder is God? Is the reward God promises the faithful more glorious, weighty, and real for you than anything this life has to offer? What steps can you take to come to a deeper and more real sense of the glory of God's reward? In other words, quote unquote, The depths of our spirituality does not depend upon changing the things we do, but in doing for God what we ordinarily do for ourselves. 
quote Brother Lawrence. All right, so that is the commentary. Very excellent commentary. The Hall of Faithful Servants. Now, I love in this commentary how it compared sports glory to the heavenly glory, the most highest glory, and how it compared like a sports hall of fame to basically like a spiritual uh, remembrance, like a spiritual hall of faithful servants. So when you read Hebrews 11, it shows you like all the people of the faith and what they've done for the Lord. Notice it was all for the Lord. It wasn't for themselves. It was for God and for Israel. Notice that. Everything every person brought up was for God and for Israel. They always did it for the Lord of Israel. God is calling us to do things for him and Israel. Amen. Him and his kingdom, y'all. Remember, Abraham, promises, descendants, you know, everything, man. David, he put on for Israel and the Most High. They all did, man. Samuel, Moses, they all did. And we're put on earth to represent God and Israel. We're put on earth to... You know, be champions for the Lord, conquerors and more than conquerors. Amen. We're winners. We're achievers. OK, people got to stop walking around with their heads all down and insecure, low self-esteem and stuff, man. Like, yo, the Lord loves you. He blessed you. Your faith is what's going to, you know, is what's important. What you do for the Lord while you're here with this time that we're given is important. OK, so let us be champions for the Lord. Let us be winners, conquerors for God, man. All right. The Hall of Faithful Servants, all right? Do something amazing and, amazing and mighty through, 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 for God through your faith, all right? Your faith, people, faith. No more doubt, no more skepticism, no more insecurity, no more inferiority, okay? The Lord is your strength, people. The Lord, by your faith, people, your faith, all right? And as we know, faith without works is dead, all right? So faith, 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 all right? Now, that's the book of Hebrews 11 in a commentary reading. Now let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 12, all right? Hebrews chapter 12, here we go. God disciplines his sons, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and not, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God? Consider him who endured such opposition, opposition, opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Mm -hmm. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? Hmm. If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits in life and live? Mm -hmm. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Mm hmm. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. <laughs> Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Warning against refusing God. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Mm. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau. Hmm. For a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his, this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. Mm. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm. To a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. 
If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Hmm. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels and joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men, made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less we will we? If we turn away from him who warns us from heaven at that time, at that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that, that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm, amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So that is the book of Hebrews chapter 12 reading. All right. Very excellent, potent reading. All right. I would love to read this in commentary scripture within Hebrews chapter 12. All right. And the title of it is Jesus perfects our faith. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yes, yes, y'all, he is the perfecter of our faith. I love saying it at the end of the messages, you know, he definitely is that, amen. Yes, so as we review Hebrews, chapter 12, just goes further into detail about how God disciplines his sons how he disciplines us, all right, and how we should not um, feel a certain way about it. You know, we should actually thank him for it because if God is disciplining you, that means he actually loves you. Um, if he ain't disciplining you, then I don't know what to tell you, <laughs> right? But when you have a child and they act up, you love that child, you straighten them out, all right? So the Lord loves us. He straightened us out from all of, all of our filth, all of our unholiness, all of our backsliding, all of the stuff we've done and the way we went about things, how we handled matters and situations, he straightened us out from it, okay? He's spiritually disciplining us. He's purifying us. He's refining us. He's molding us, okay? He wants to get all that junk and filth out of our temples, out of our systems, out of our lives. He wants to remove that out of our lives, okay? We keep carrying around this filth and junk within our temples and the way we go about things. God is disciplining you so you can, so you can stop moving in that way, stop moving in that fashion, all right? We have to move according to the faith, according to his word, and according to his spirit. That's how he's supposed to move. We're not supposed to be moving all wrong and silly and out of control, all right? So God is disciplining us, straightening us out, all right? That's also, when you read Hebrews chapter 12, um, it goes further to say how no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Yes, yes. That's a very real true thing right there. At the moment, it hurts. It's, you know, painful, grueling experience. But afterwards, it straightened you out. It bettered you as a person. You became much more obedient, faithful, and strong through it. Amen. So, something to always keep in mind about. Hebrews chapter 12 goes more further to detail about warnings against refusing God. All right, all right. Let us always stay faithful to the Lord. Let us keep obeying him and stick it to him and his word and his promise and be in alignment, okay? So always remember that he is the consuming fire. All right, so we got to serve him in fear and love and reverence and awe, okay? So that's the book of Hebrews chapter 12, all right? Now let us go to the book of Hebrews chapter 13. Concluding exhortations. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Hmm. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who were mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? 
Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their life, their way of life, and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most highly place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such, such, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. May the God of peace, who through the blood of eternal of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good thing, with, with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers, I urge you to bear with my word of ex exhortation, for I have written you only a short letter. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all God's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. All right. So that's the book of Hebrews chapter 13 reading. All right. All right. All right. So that's concluding exhortations. All right. And that's just a good read overall. It says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The marriage should be honored. The, bed, the marriage better be kept pure. That God will judge the adulterer and the sexual immorally, okay? Those who are sexually immoral. Um, always be hospital. Always show peace towards strangers because you might be entering an angel without even knowing it. So there's angels all around, you know what I'm saying? You got to be mindful of that. And, um, yeah, and just always just pray. And stay strong through it all. That's a very great ending to the book of Hebrews. Um, the, the scripture says that there's no there's no one's unknown of who wrote the book of Hebrews as an unknown author of it. Um, the way it ended with writing about Timothy, this gives me the notion that probably Paul wrote Hebrews, probably, or you know, or James. Or, it could have been anybody, but all know the book of Hebrews is an excellent read. All right, so that sums up the whole book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews has thirteen chapters in it. Very powerful, excellent read. Very happy to read this book and share it with you all. I think it's a great read. I mean, it's just very amazing, man. And I just love the Word of God. I love reading it, and we have to be doers of it, okay? So let us always share it with somebody. Never know how much that person out there may need it in a timing that they're going through, okay? Never know how much just one scripture could be quoted to them that could cheer them up, amen? So let us help out as much people as we can through the Word, through Christ, through faith, through the Spirit, through, with love, amen? Yes, yes, y'all. So that is the book of Hebrews. All right, that's the word for today. After this, we'll be going to the book of James. All right, so that'll be discussed more in the next episode of the Bible reading series. All right. So this weekend is going to be the focus on the news roundup and the church note. Okay, so that is the book of Hebrews. All right, so there you have it. What I would love to do as I close out is give all the praise, honor, and glory to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and praise His only begotten Son who died for our sins. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So here we go. Yes, yes, y'all. Hallelujah. He is the hope for humanity, y'all. Most definitely. He is the Adam, the second Adam, the last Adam, the advocate, the almighty, true and living God, the Alpha and Omega. Amen. Amen. The apostle of our profession, the arm of the Lord, the atonement sacrifice for our sins, the author and finisher of our faith, the author and perfecter of our faith, the author of life, the author of salvation, the beginning and the end, the beginning of creation of God the beloved son, the blessed and only potent, the blessed and only ruler, the branch, the bread of God, the bread of life, the bridegroom, the capstone, the captain of salvation, the chief cornerstone, the chief shepherd, Christ, the Christ of God, the consolation of Israel, the cornerstone, the counselor, wonderful counselor, the creator, 
the day spring, the deliverer, the desire of the nations, the door, the elect of God, Emmanuel, the eternal life, the everlasting father, the faith and true witness, faithful and true, the faithful witness, the first and the last, the first begotten, the first born from the dead, first born of all creation, the forerunner, the gate, the glory of the Lord, God, the good shepherd, the great high priest, the great shepherd, the head of the church, the heir of all things, the high priest, holy and true, the holy one, the hope, the hope of glory, the horn of salvation, the I am, the I am that I am, the image of God, Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the judge of Israel, the judge, king eternal. He is the king of Israel. Amen. He is the king of kings. Hallelujah. He is the king of kings and Lord of lords. Hosanna, Hosanna. King of saints, king of the ages, king of the Jews, the king, the lamb, the lamb of God, the lamb without blemish, the last Adam, the lawgiver, the leader and commander, the life, the light of the world, the line of the tribe of Judah, the living one, the living stone, the Lord, the Lord, our righteousness, the Lord is my portion, the Lord is my rock, the Lord is my salvation, the Lord is my strength, the Lord is my deliverer, the Lord is my redeemer, the Lord is my healer, the Lord is my everything. Yes, yes, y'all, the Lord is my salvation, the Lord is my refuge. The Lord is my good fortress. The Lord is my high tower. Most definitely, the Lord our God is one. There's no other like him. Yes, yes, y'all. No wisdom of counsel against the Lord. Most definitely. Yah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yahweh, Yahweh, Ben Yahweh, 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 Yeshua, Hamashiach, Barakatha, Shalom, Shalom, Yeshua, Elohim, Ahai, Yeshua, the Father of lights, the Father of mercies, the Father of the fatherless, the Father of widows, the God of heaven and earth. His only begotten son sits at the right hand of him. The government rests on his shoulders. He is the great physician to heal all things. He is the carpenter to fix all things. With God, all things are possible to those who believe. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. The Father and Son are amazing. Very amazing. Give them all the praise, all the praise. Give them all the glory, most definitely. He is the Lord of all, the Lord of glory, the Lord of lords, the man from heaven, the man of sorrows, the mediator of the new covenant, the mediator the messenger of the covenant, the Messiah, the mighty God, the mighty one, the morning star, the Nazarene, the offspring of David, the only begotten son of God, our great God and savior, our holiness, our spiritual husband, our Passover, our protection, our redemption, our righteousness, our sacrificed Passover lamb, the power of God, the precious cornerstone, the prince of kings, the prince of life, the prince of peace, the prophet, the redeemer, the resurrection of life, the resurrector, the life, the resurrection, the revelation, the revelator, the righteous branch, the righteous one, the radiant one, the perfect example, the rock, the root of David, the rose of Sharon, the rule of God's creation, the rule of the kings of the earth, the savior, the seed of woman, the shepherd and bishop of souls, the Shiloh, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of God, the son of man, son of the blessed, son of the most high God, the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, the son of righteousness, the just one, the one mediator, the stone the builders rejected, the true bread, the true God, the true light, the true vine. Yes, he is the truth. Amen. He is the way. Hallelujah. He is the way, truth, and life. The wisdom of God, the witness, the wonderful counselor, the word, the word of God, the word of life, the word of Yahuwah, the word of Elohim, the word of Yeshua HaMashiach, the word of Yahweh Shai, the word of Yahusha, Yahusha, Yeshua, the word of the consuming fire. Amen. He is the word. We touch and agree. Amen. Most definitely, y'all. The Lord is so awesome. His son is amazing for dying for our sins, y'all. Boast in the Lord, boast in the Lord, boast in the Lord. He is excellent, he is worthy, he is able, he is awesome, he is mighty. Most definitely, y'all. Boast in the Lord. His son definitely died for our sins, y'all. He is the seed of Abraham, promise, the seed of Adam, humanity, the seed of David, kingship, the seed of God, deity, the seed of Jacob, nationality, the seed of Judah, tribe, the seed of Shem, race, the seed of woman, prophecy. Yes, yes, in the authority and the power name of Jesus Christ, you are healed, renewed, restored, redeemed, forgiven, embraced, love. You are redeemed. You are love. New mind, new heart, new soul, new hands to prosper, new footsteps, new path, new journey, new everything, new footsteps, new seasons, new life, new open doors, new miracles, new signs, new wonders, new endeavors, new prosperity, all right, new abilities, new gifts, everything new. The Lord is doing a new thing, amen, new outcomes, new news, good news, amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Stability, steadfast, faithfulness, love, joy, grace, merry heart, gladness. I speak those things over your life forevermore. Renewed strength. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So that is the word for today. All right. The book of Hebrews reading. Very excellent reading right there. I loved every chapter of it. Amen. Very great, great read. So that's the word for today. All right. I pray to God that whoever is listening to this, I pray that you get baptized, touch life for the most high. You repent and turn from your ways and stop backsliding. Stay on that narrow path for the Lord. 
I just pray the Lord just stay with you and he keep on blessing you, looking out for you. And these trying times that everybody's in all four corners of the earth, all right? So before I give y'all this priestly, before I close out, I would love to give y'all this priestly blessing on the way out. All right. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. I'm Jarvis Kingston. I got much love for you all. God bless you all. Peace.